I, I, I want to speak this morning about grace. Could everybody say the word grace? And you, uh, you mentioned my wife, Pastor Amar, and uh, I have experienced grace from my wife uh, as we have parented eight children together. Uh, six, our six adopted children are in their 20s, and we still have our biological children that are 11 and 13 now. They're still at home. That's a whole nother story. But just to say that the prayers that we prayed in our 20s for, for babies... This is going to set somebody free. There's no expiration date on the prayers that you pray. We didn't, we didn't start having babies until we were in our 40s. And that's, again, you need, you need grace for kids, but you really need grace when you're having babies in your 40s. And, and let me say that without his grace, I wouldn't be married. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't parent. I could, it is by his grace. And it is by his grace that I'm part of a team that oversees 21 states and 266 churches. It's by his grace that I've been able to raise up leaders, as has your pastor. I was with several pastors yesterday from the Orlando area here, and I said I'm going to be with Pastor Amar and his church tomorrow. And they were all like, oh, Pastor Amar has been so influential in my, de in my leadership development, and I am who I am today because of the grace that was upon you and the grace that has been poured out to the generations. And so this message today, Pastor, is a message of affirmation, but it is a message of challenge for all of us. Because grace is a grace that cascades from generation to generation. This summer, I took my family on a vacation, and we went to a place in Virginia called the Cascades. And you hike back a trail, and you get to the end, and there's a beautiful waterfall at the end, and it starts at the top, and it, it flows down. Uh, this is actually a picture of it behind the Cascading Grace Words, and, it, and it's oh, maybe 50, 75 feet at the top, and then it falls down, and then it hits some rocks, and then it falls down some more, and it falls down some more into a beautiful pool where you can swim. And I thought about that in light of the grace of God, the generations of the grace of God. Think for a moment. Who were the people that poured their life into you? And, and who have you poured your life into that is pouring their life into someone else that will pour their life into someone else? You see, we're going to read some words from Paul out of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, 1 and 2. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to that passage. But Paul is at this place where he's in prison. It's probably his his dying letter. He's writing this at the end of his life. And he says these words out of a question, and the, and the question isn't written, but I think the question is, is it worth it? How many of you have ever thought about, you know, you're, we're serving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're giving of our time and our talent and our treasures. And how many of you ever asked the question to yourself, is this really worth it? Let me just see your hands. Man, I've asked that question over and over and over again. Is it really worth it, all the sleepless nights, Pastor? Is it really worth it, all the energy? Is it really worth it, the time, the money? Is it really worth it? And Paul's asking this question, and he writes these words to his son, Timothy, his spiritual son. And in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, these are the words. You then, my son, be strong in the grace. Let's just say that phrase together. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let's say that again. 
Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where does the grace come from? The grace comes from Christ Jesus. And in that grace, we get to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You see, without that grace, the strongest person is weak. He goes on to say in verse 2, And the things you, Timothy, have heard me, Paul, say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, I know we're four square here. <clears throat> I read this passage. This is out of the NIV. And if you read it out of the King James or some of the other passages, it says, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So I was reading this out of a different version. I changed it to people, and I preached it, and I said, you know, reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. I had a man come to me that week. He come into my office. He was, had his arms crossed, and he said, Pastor, he said, you changed the Bible. I said, oh, okay, pray tell. And he says, you changed that from reliable men to reliable people. I said, well, in actuality, let's do a quick word study here because I happen to know the Greek word for that. And it's humankind. It's not men as in he, he's not saying you only pour yourself into the men of the church. The only time this is used um, for a man is actually the Greek word is when it's talking about circumcision in, in I believe it's Matthew or something. So uh, every other time it's used for humankind, which is why it's translated person. We're not changing the word of God. We're being true to what the word of God says. Come on. Ladies. This works for you like it works for the men. It is not a sexist passage of Scripture. So we say, the grace is for all of us. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, aren't you glad that the witnesses from thousands of years ago that that message of grace has been passed down from Paul to Timothy to reliable people who taught others, who taught others, who taught others, who taught others, and it finally cascaded down to us. Amen? Amen. That cascading grace should not stop with us. Right. You see, this is where we have to continue to think, I'm glad for the grace. I'm glad for my wife giving me grace. Let me just tell you a little story about grace, and this is the difference between grace and mercy. Now, mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Now, in Chesapeake, Virginia, where I'm from, I'm very, we do a lot of work with the police department, and our community transformation projects come through the police department. They identify areas of underserved neighborhoods, and they'll say to the churches, hey, you know, our job, we'll, we'll lock the bad guys up, but if we lock the bad guys up and the church doesn't come in and really deal with the issues in the community, then we're just going to be locking more bad guys up. So let's partner together. We'll go in, lock the bad guys up, and then the church comes in and does what the church does. And so... We've had this wonderful partnership. Well, I was talking to the police captain, and he says, um, around Thanksgiving, they do this thing called ticket or a turkey. And so uh, our, our church is on a 25-mile-an-hour speed you know, zone, and, and people love to go 45 through there. And so the police officer sits out front. Sometimes he sits in the church parking lot and gets the people going 45 in the 25. In Virginia, that is a criminal offense. It's reckless driving. And so the police officer comes up, and he says, you know why I'm pulling you over? Ah, I might have been going a little fast. Yes, you're facing criminal charges because you, were, you doubled the speed limit in a residential area. And they say, oh, man. I mean, I could actually go to jail. 
And the police officer says, I'm going to give you a choice. And you get one chance to decide. I'm going to either give you a ticket and cite you to appear before the judge, or I'm going to give you a turkey. And this is the look that they always get. What are you, what are you talking about? You get to choose a ticket or a turkey. Can I choose the turkey? Yes, I just gave you a choice. Choose the ticket or the turkey. You see, mercy says, I'm not going to send you before the judge for going double the speed limit in the residential area in front of the church. That's mercy. Grace is when he goes to his trunk, he opens the cooler, and he pulls out a frozen turkey, and he takes it up, and he hands it to the person instead of the ticket. You see, that's grace. Mercy says, I'm not sending you to jail. Grace says, I'm going to give you a turkey instead. Aren't you glad for mercy and for grace? <clears throat> My wife gave me one of the biggest grace gifts ever. It was early on in our marriage, and I was cooking eggs, you know, making hard-boiled eggs, and I'm not the greatest chef in the world. And my brother called, and he never calls. And so I picked up the phone. Eggs are on the stove, you know. I'm talking to my brother, and then I realized, oh, my word, i got to be at the church office in 10 minutes. So I said, hey, brother, i got to go. I hung up the phone, and I ran to the car and jumped in the car, and guess what was still on the stove? So my wife gets home from work eight hours later. The eggs had exploded. It smelled like, there, like there's smoke in the house. She goes in thinking the house is on fire. And, I, and, and like I get home 10 minutes after she gets home, and she, she's not real happy, okay? But she did, not, she did not say anything to me about how awful that was. She took the next day off work, washed every curtain, every pillow, every bedspread, all the clothes, did everything, and never once, never once made me feel bad for what I had done. Whew, you ain't kidding, brother. I'm telling you, that's grace at its finest. I didn't deserve it, but that's grace. Now, I want you to think of your life, and I want you to ask yourself this. How do I build strong people with his grace? How do I do that? How do you do that? I really enjoy working on cars. I, I have a bunch of cars. I have old cars. I have classic cars. I have, you know, I just, I love fiddling, tinkering, puttering, all that stuff. There's usually grease under my nails. I really did try and clean up, you know, like scrub them and I'm like, I'm going to go preach at a church. I better be. But my place of extending grace is in my garage. One of my mentors, his place of extending grace is in his canoe out on the river. And I want to ask you this, what works for you? Every one of us should come out of here with a game plan of how we're going to allow God's grace to cascade through us to the next generation of people. How do we do that? Let me get, uh, let me get a couple of volunteers here, all right? <clears throat> Would a young man with the uh, ear, earring, would, would you be willing to come and, and uh, participate in my, in my uh, there we go, and yeah, get, get you, we need the, uh, go ahead, yeah, come on, yeah, all right, you work on cars, you work on cars too, you work on cars, you, uh, what do you like, what do you like to work on, come on now, come on, you come, Come on over to the garage, and you'll experience some grace. Next time you're in Chesapeake, Virginia, you got, I got a lift and the tire machine. I mean, we got the whole thing. It's got the whole thing. What's your name? Ezra? All right. Michael? Becky. I got that. I got that part. Okay. Uh, Becky, Michael, I want you to stand over here. And uh, Becky, you stand beside me. All right. Now, visually, I want you to see how the Four generations of the gospel works from what we said in 
2 Timothy 2.2. 2. All right, so I'm going to represent Paul. You're going to represent Timothy. And then you're going to represent the reliable people who are qualified to teach others. And then we're going to rotate, all right, because I'm the old guy, all right? And we're going to say I am in prison and Nero is about ready to light me as a torch and put me in his garden and, you know, all the horrible things that happen. But I have invested well into Becky, all right? So when I am gone, does the grace stop? It doesn't stop. You see, sometimes... Sometimes we think we are so important in God's process. And we think, it all depends on me. If I'm not here, it'll all fall apart. You know what that is? That's not grace, that's pride. And pride will always stop the extension of grace. I want you to take your hands and, and hold, it, hold, hold them up like this, okay? Palms up, we call it. Now, God has imparted to us grace. When we close our hands, that is pride saying, I am going to hold on to that which God has given me, and I'm going to keep it for myself. It's self-sustaining, not grace-facilitating. I want you to always, always, always think palms up. If God wants to put something in your hand, that's good. If he wants to take something out of your hand, that's good. It's powerful. It's passed on, okay? And so everything that I have, everything that I own, everything that's in my garage, <laughs> it's right here. Lord, if you want to take it away, if you want to put something in, it's, it's humbling when he puts something in. Sometimes it's a role. Sometimes it's finances. Sometimes, but it's not for me. So now I take the grace that I've been given. I give it to Becky, but I don't necessarily give it to Becky when I am in prison. I don't know if she could even get in to visit in prison, but the investment that was made from Paul to Timothy throughout all the time that they were together, just takes a little letter and says, hey, here's a little reminder. I'm going to send this, and it's going to remind you of the grace. Now, remember what Paul wrote, 1 Timothy, that which is in, and I'm going to get these wrong, which was in your Mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois, or vice versa on one of those. I can't remember which one's the mother and which one's the grandmother. Is also in you. It was cascaded generationally, but it was given as a gift, and all Paul needed to do was just remind Aren't you, don't you like those kind of things where, do you ever have somebody that knows you so well, all they need to do is just give you a hand sign or they need to, like, a, a, a smile or something that they, they text you an emoji and it's like, and it's like, you know exactly what they're thinking, okay? You see, that's what Paul did to Timothy. He just sent this letter and he said, oh yeah, be strong in the grace. Boom! Everything that Paul had poured into him reminded him of the generational cascading grace that was already the anointing upon his life, okay? Man, we need to do that to the next generation over and over and over again. You ever get discouraged? Come on, be honest with me. You ever get discouraged? Isn't it awesome when somebody reminds you of the grace of God? Don't you forget it. You know, we're singing these songs up here, and I'm like, oh, your faithfulness, Lord, your faithfulness. And I'm thinking about Moses, and I'm thinking about Abraham, and I'm thinking about Joseph, and I'm thinking about my kids, and then I'm thinking about my, my parents and my grandparents, and I'm thinking about, oh, your faithfulness, Lord, it's so good. How could this little tiny problem that I'm facing now succumb to the goodness and the faithfulness and the grace of God? Woo! 
All right, so I've given you the grace. And it's all for you, you know, it's just stick it in your backpack, bury it underneath your, your, your bed, stick it in a box, whatever, and just have a glory hallelujah time until Jesus comes or you're called home. Is that, is that what it's for? It's not. What's the purpose of it? You see, here's the thing. The beautiful principle of the cascading grace is that you cannot, somebody needs to get this, you, you cannot outgive God's grace. Matter of fact, the more you give it away, the more it comes in. And you think, oh, I got to hold on to it because I won't have enough. That is a scarcity, poverty mentality, and it is not what God's grace is to us. I might have to shed this jacket because I'm starting to sweat up here. But we give it. And then what do you do it? Entrust to reliable. Who are the reliables that are around you? All right? The Lord's going to give us eyes to see it. I want you to entrust to a reliable person. Now, how does she know that you're reliable? Because she sees the little mm, she sees the little bit of grace that you've been given and says, I recognize faithfulness. That's the reliable part. You've been faithful with the little. You'll be faithful with the much. The prophetic word to you, you've been faithful on the bottom step. Now come up a few more steps. Open the door because behind the door, is a flood of grace that you haven't even seen yet. But you're going to be faithful to look around you. I want you to do this. I want you to look around you in your mind's eye and say, who are the faithful men and women around you that need an impartation, a prophetic impartation? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, that we, we comfort, we encourage, we exhort with the word of the Lord. Who needs? The word of the Lord. Now, let me just say this. I call it stating the obvious. Because when you start functioning under the grace of God prophetically, you're going to see things and you think, well, of course, everybody else sees that. But they don't. It could be as simple as the, the checkout person at the Walmart or the Target or wherever, and you see the grace of God on them, and you say, hmm, hmm. You know what? You just have a, such an amazing joy about you. Has anybody ever told you you have a beautiful smile? And they look at you and say, nobody's ever said that. And I'm like, how could they not have said that? It's so obvious. It's because the spirit of God's grace is upon you to call forth that which is unseen by those whose eyes are blinded. And you see it by the grace of God. You see it by the Spirit of God. This is the way we live. So you, as a reliable person, you got your head on a swivel. You're looking around. You're like God's radar. Who do you need me to see, Lord? Who do you need me to see? Who do you... Oh, this one got my attention. Why did this one get my attention? I think about when I was a youth pastor. And my wife, we are very different personalities, okay? We've been married for over 30 years, and it should not have worked as far as our personalities and the way we, I mean, it's just like every personality test says, yeah, not so much. <laughs> and so we have needed grace to work it out. But I remember there was a young man, well, there's a lot of young men, but I would bring him over to my garage, and we'd be working, and my wife said, man, you just need to cut that guy loose. Like he is, he's getting ready to drop out of school. He's not, he, he, there's no reason to pour your life into this guy. And I'm like, nope, I see it. I see it. I see it. He's like, well, I don't. But I saw it. You know, he is a very amazing, successful pastor down in Texas and has led some, some huge ministries, and it's the, it's the least of these. The least of these. Tell you another story. 
I was, there was another, another guy, he was a drug addict, he was on the street, he had a beautiful family, two kids, and he was, he was out there just back and forth, in and out of drugs, and the pastor of my church said, cut him loose, man, don't, don't even, don't, don't pour into that guy, you are wasting your time. Again, God wouldn't let me cut him loose. I saw something and I said, okay, this is one of my reliable men. This is one of my reliable guys. A few years later, I'm pastoring church and four hours away, guess who walks in? Hands me a business card. He says, I have a ministry called 99 and 1, and it was Steve. And he said, I go on the streets of D.C. He still lived in the area where we were. He said, Anybody can call me 24 hours a day, and I will go and get them off the street and get them to a safe spot because that's what you did for me. I would have never known. But the grace said, you know what? In trust. In trust. Because I may never see you because you're not at the end of the line. You are part of the line. But just because I don't see from my vantage point, hey, I know you. We spent time together. Timothy, my son, by name. But after that, I may never know the names of the people. Doesn't mean that it doesn't go on and on and on and on and on. So I ask yourself the question, let's just start with Timothy. Who's your Timothy? Who's your Becky? If the answer to that question is, I don't know, I'm sad, but I'm not hopeless. Because all of us, I think, most of us anyway, are still breathing in the room. There's a couple, you know, it's a, a hope, I hope you are, you know. It's like, but, but the whole thing is, there's still time to change. You can receive the grace today. I can receive the grace from heaven, and then I turn around, and I give it away, and it's given away, and it's given away, and it's given away. There's not a single person here that is outside of the grace of God. I don't know most of you. (laughs) Met some of you. But I can say this. The grace of God is here for you, and some of you feel like you're you're beyond, you're too far gone, that you can't come back. You may be a thousand steps away, but it is one step back by his grace. And when you look at who you're gonna pour your life into with grace, don't write anybody off. Just don't, don't, don't even let yourself do that. See through the eyes of the Spirit and say, Lord, is this who you want me to invest my life into, the grace that is within me? Would you give them a hand and thank, you, thank them for, and, and give, them the, give them the grace. Give them the grace. I said this yesterday to the pastors, and when we talk about investing grace, When people say, Durant, thank you for spending time with me, I almost always pause them and say, I don't have time to spend with anyone. They're like, I said, I have time to invest for the kingdom in people. You see, if I spend money, I go to the Wawa, the 7-Eleven, whatever you have down here, Circle K, whatever it is, and I, I buy a big, you know, gulp of soda or whatever, and, and, uh, I, and I drink it, it's gone. I will never see that again. I spent. But when I invest, I expect what? A return on my investment. I know it's not a good time economically to talk about our investments. I just, I just don't think about that right now. But we expect that the rule of 72 works. Take your interest rate, you divide, it by, or you divide 72 by your interest rate, and that's how many years it takes for your money to double. And we expect that at the end of that time, we're going to have more than what we put in. 
Now, here's the thing. If I'm spending time on people, I'm not expecting a kingdom return. But if I'm investing grace, I expect that the king, who is the Lord of the harvest, somebody shout, the Lord of the harvest is still going to bring that to fruition. One plants, you might be a planter, a waterer, but who brings the increase? God brings the increase. Now, on a practical level, how do I do this? How do we do this? I want to contrast two models of investing grace. One is the Greek model. You have the Hebrew model and the Greek model. That's what I'm going to contrast. But the Hebrew model is um, much more relational. The Greek model is like, I need to transfer information to you, actually, much like we do today a lot of times in preaching and teaching. The other person stand up, they have information, they put it up on a PowerPoint, you all take notes, and then you go out and nothing changes. <laughs> I mean, just the reality. How many times have you gone through school and you learn things and you ask a week later, so do you know how to do this? No, I don't, I don't know how to do it. My grandfather had an eighth grade education. My mother did not graduate from school. I was the first of our family to get a degree. And I think two of the smartest people in my life are my mom and my grandfather. And the reason why they are smart is because they embodied a more Hebrew mindset of learning. They were with, my grandfather was an orphan. He was hired out to a farm. The farm, he grew, um, he grew up on, the, on that farm, learned how to farm because that's what kept him alive. And when he became a farmer himself, he did not, it wasn't because he went through all the books and knew how to plant seeds and how to harvest and where to sell and all of that kind of stuff. It was because he had received from an experience that had changed his life out of desperation And this is the way we like to impart grace. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little lecture, everyone, now. Now I want you to just sit down, and I'm going to tell you about grace. Well, grace is God's unmerited favor, and here's a little story about grace. Oh, wait, it sounds like what I just did for you guys. Okay, but unless we experience the grace of God, how are those that you're leading going to experience the grace of God? They're going to experience the grace of God as they're in the garage changing a motor out and something doesn't go the way it's supposed to and I react or respond, how? Blankety, blank, blank, blank. This is so, God, what is going on here? What did they just learn about the grace of God? Short temper, it's no, there's no grace, but when something falls on your finger and out comes, mm, thank you, Jesus, for your, <laughs> woo, thank you for your grace right now. More is caught than taught. See, if we do this right, the grace that is extended is, is it, it's extended in real life application. It's an experience. It is not passive. I don't tell you what grace is. I show you what grace is. My son has the responsibility. He's 13. His older brother just got married. He was 20. He's 22. Just moved out last month. And so now the, you, you know, responsibilities kind of roll downhill to the youngest one. And so all the older kids are like, you're so easy on the younger kids. You know, they don't have to do chores like we did. And, and with 10 people in the house, my wife had a chart for everything. We had a chart on when you did laundry. We had a chart on when you did dishes and who put them away. And I mean, there was like every, it was, it was like very structured. We had to be. And now with only, you know, four or five of us in the house, it's like, 
ah, okay, and we're older now, and so, you know, you know how it goes. And so uh, my 22-year-old, he didn't want to put the trash out before he, before he left. You know, like, dude, I'm not charging you rent. Just put the trash cans out every Thursday night. Like, set yourself an alarm. Do this. All you got to do is clean your room, your bathroom, and put it out. And like, I just, he would pay the 13-year-old to put the... <laughs> dude, how much do I got to pay you to put the trash cans out? Well, now he moved out, so now the responsibility is the 13-year-old's. He don't get paid for it. I don't pay him for it, all right? That, that was a sweet gig. You just, you just take that, and, and I'm not paying you. But guess what happens Friday morning? I get up to go to the gym. Are the trash cans out on the curb? Trash cans aren't out on the curb. I have a, an opportunity, okay? I have an opportunity to disciple my child. How do I do it? You idiot, why are you, you know, get your butt out of bed and get those trash cans out there before that trash man comes in five minutes. I'm just going to be real, okay? I didn't do it. I didn't do it, all right? I didn't do it. I can't say that I didn't think about it, okay? That would be, that, I, I'm, just, I'm just real. I'm, I'm a human being, all right? Grace says, I'm going to bring him along on a journey because someday he might be a dad and he might be having his 13-year-old not putting the trash cans out. And how do I want him responding to my grandchild? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. See, I've had to go back and repent to some of my kids and say, I'm sorry for the way I reacted five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's not recently, but I'm, I'm sure there's things that I got to, but how do we teach that grace? We live with people in that grace. And some of you are going to take this sermon and you're going to say, hmm, I need to go back and make some things right because I told somebody something that I didn't live. Let's be real. And if we leave this place without self-evaluating and say, I was wrong. And I didn't teach you well. Would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? Here's just a couple of things that, well, let me say this. Let me say this quote before I just give you a couple of points on how we build strong people with his grace. But leadership is both something you are and something you do. A mentor is not a person who can do the work better than his followers. They are a person who can get his followers to do the work better than he can. You see, sometimes as a mentor or as that Paul figure, we like to say, we got it all together, we're amazing, and you all will hopefully catch up someday. <laughs> dun, 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 look at me. But in reality, if we're doing this grace thing right, we're saying, I want you to do it better than me because that means that I have connected you to the source. Woo! I get the Holy Ghost chicken skin on that one. Because at the end of the day, I pray that my eight kids outlive me and that they all know the grace of God that I was connected to. Woo! Because here, listen, my grandmother, I caught my grandmother praying for me. I'd go in and I would see her kneeling at the chair. She didn't know I was coming into the house and I'd catch her kneeling there praying for me and listen to her. I would eavesdrop on her prayers and she was praying for every one of her grandkids. And when my grandmother died, I felt this, this lack of prayer support. And I said, Lord, if that's the way this thing works, then I am going to pray that every one of my descendants and my mother right now, she prays that every single one of her descendants, and she has 
my brother's adopted five kids too, and so we have, we have six, so she's got more adopted kids. Then she says, I pray that every one of my biological grandchildren, every one of my adopted grandchildren, every one of the foster children that have been in the home, every one of the children that are connected with that, that they would all serve by the grace of God for all of eternity. Praying grandmothers, let me just tell you, you have a tremendous influence on what happens to the generations. I'm thankful for that. But here's a couple of things that have helped me. How do I build strong people with his grace? Number one is know the grace giver personally. It goes back to the word that I gave you. You can't lead worship unless you are intimate in worship. It doesn't start on the platform. It starts in your prayer closet. We can't give the grace that we don't have from being with him, personally knowing him. We incarnationally live by grace. We are so full of grace that the sponge, when life squeezes us, Pastor Shonda, our district supervisor, who's my boss, says, whatever's down in the well comes up in the bucket. I'm like, boy, whatever's in the sponge, when you squeeze it, is going to come out. And if I'm saturated, in the presence of the Lord by his grace. How many of you know life, life just has a way of squeezing you, doesn't it? It just does. And when, and when you get squeezed, grace comes out. That's where I want to live every day. The second thing is not, not only do we know the grace giver personally, but we live by the grace that he provides. It's one thing to know about the grace. It's one thing to even know the grace giver. But do we live by his grace? I'll tell you, I had something happen to me. I'm not going to go into the details. But God gave me a gift of grace just within the past two months. And I said, I said, God, I don't deserve this. And he said, yeah, that's the whole point. You don't deserve grace. But God, this is, and he said, would you just receive it? And you know, the beauty of it is I'm not holding on to something that five years ago, had he given me that same gift of grace, I, it's a material possession. And I said, and I said, I would not, I would have held it like this, like, ooh, 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 gotta keep it, gotta keep it, gotta keep it. He took me back 30 years to when I was in Bible school, and I had, uh, I had a, a Jeep that I had fully, completely restored and built from scratch and put it together, and it was my pride and joy, and I have to admit, back in, in those uh, immature days, it owned me. I did not own it, it owned me, and I put a, a license plate on it personalized with my name on it, all right, and I had a custom everything, and and uh, I was the man when I went to Bible school. And I was like, yeah, uh -huh, you all have those slumming cars over there. Like, they all broke down like Bible school cars. And I am rolling, okay? And, and, you know, it's just like I think back now and I'm like, oh, dear Jesus. Freshman semester, first, first semester freshman year, somebody had the audacity to steal my license plate with my name on it. And a couple other odd accessories that just made me just, oh, I was torqued. Yeah, exactly. What were they going to do with it? So I had to say, God, why did you do this to me? You know what his answer was? It was so good. He said, well, I could have had him steal the whole thing. And where would you be then? <laughs> like, like, it's not hard to steal that vehicle, okay? And you know what it was? It was one of those humbling moments where the Lord said to me, either you deal with your issues or I will take care of them because you can't have two gods. We sang about it today. You can't have two gods. And boy, I immediately hit my knees and I said, dear Lord, dear Lord, I repent because I don't want to lose that thing, okay? <laughs> My motives weren't like, Lord, I just, you know, what you, I was like, I don't want to lose that. He got my attention, okay? Yeah, and, and it's like, it's like, 
how do I live by the grace he provides? He is a good, good father, and he's constantly nudging us to receive his grace and receive it with humility. Because humility and grace really go hand in hand. And so we, we know the grace giver. We live by his grace, and then we can entrust his grace to others. You see, we're, we're living incarnationally. What did Jesus do? Jesus came from heaven to earth. He, he became flesh, dwelt among us to show us the grace of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. And he said, I'm going to show you how to live. And we try and tell people how to live and we don't show them how to live because it takes time to be intimate. It takes time to receive the grace, and it takes time to give the grace in relationship. We want to we wanna microwave it. We want to just be like, hey, let's come to church. Let me just, could you, Pastor, could you just pray for me? I just want to just, you know, microwave. Done. Just, just do it like that. Just go, just like that. I'll just tell you, it doesn't happen like that. This is a lifetime of doing this. If you look at the children of Israel, you had those who experienced God. They experienced the presence and the power of God as they came out of Egypt in one night. You had the next generation. They saw their parents experiencing God. But the third generation only heard about the experience. And I can tell you this whole four generations of the gospel breaks down if every generation does not hear, experience the grace of God. You can't just hear about what happened to Paul in prison. You have to know the God that Paul knew in prison. You have to experience the grace that Paul knew when he was in the darkest time. Two questions that I want to ask you as we close. How are you living in his grace? How are you living in his grace right now? Because the very thing that you're living in his grace is the very thing that God is going to use to not just educate the next generation, but is going to use to impart grace to that next generation. Second question is, to whom are you imparting that grace? There, there needs to be a name associated with the impartation of grace. I, uh, I went to Walmart on Friday. I didn't know if it would make it through, through TSA or not. But um, I, I did ask them before I went through pre-check. I said, uh, hey, I've got a slinky in my bag. Is that going to be okay? All right? I didn't know if they were going to think it was some, like, weapon or something. But, you know, this was one of my favorite toys as a kid. And it was actually invented in 1943 by accident. But I used to love going to the staircase. And you know how it walks down the staircase? Remember those days? It was almost like a little miracle. And you know what the Lord spoke to me as I picked up the slinky? He said, that's like cascading grace. See, the guy that invented it was inventing it for a completely different purpose to keep electronic equipment safe. He was just doing a spring that was trying to keep him from, from bouncing and so forth, and it, and it fell off the table. But when it fell, it didn't fall. It cascaded. And it began to walk. And I think we need to look at the grace of God in our life and remember that it's not an accident that he 
has placed us where he's placed us, with the people where he's placed us, with the grace, how you've experienced the grace and those names that are attached to you. And so I say, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. And this is the prayer that I wrote for me. This is my prayer for the week. Because you see, I, I don't ever preach a sermon that I don't preach to myself. This is my prayer. Lord, help me to live by your grace every day. Lead me daily as I teach grace to those around me who need your strength. Use me to impart your grace to everyone I meet. And may your grace cascade through me to all generations. If I could just pray that over you, if you would like to have me pray that prayer over you, would you stand? And if you've never experienced the grace of God, you see, we're all sinners saved by His grace. There's not a sin that is too big for the grace of God. Let me just say that. You can't sin too much to be beyond God's grace and God's mercy. Maybe today you say, I, I don't even know. I have not experienced this grace for the first time. We just bow our heads before I pray this prayer over you. Could you, could you just, you say, I, I need that grace. Like, like you're speaking a foreign language because I, I don't incarnationally know that. Could I just see your hand? Could you just wave at me and just say, hey, I... I, I want that grace. I need that grace. I need that. Yes, yes, all over the place. Yes, 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 yes. Lord, help us to live by your grace every day. Lead us daily as you teach, as I teach grace those around me who need your strength. Use us to impart your grace to everyone we meet. May your grace cascade through us to all generations. Amen and amen.